<laughs> recording in progress. All right. All right. So if you're ready, I am ready. I'm ready. All right. Welcome, Pudding People, to another episode of Everybody Loves Pudding. I am your host, Ken Seymour. We have a fantastic episode for you today. A special guest joining us direct from what? New York, is it? Yes, Manhattan, New York. Oh, Jill Goldstein, publicist extraordinaire. <laughs> you are too kind, Ken. Uh, we... uh, I would just stop at publicist, period. Oh. I don't know. I, I've seen some of your work. I, uh, anybody that uh, anybody that represents uh, some of the people that I've seen you talk to uh, has to be uh, uh, in a league of their own, uh, uh, much like the uh, the movie, right? Thank you. <laughs> I, I appreciate that. I do. Well, I, I got really curious when I was looking a little bit before um, in preparation for this particular. Uh, interview. I I saw that uh, you have been in the industry for uh, a number of years, but you had, uh, according to your bio on your webpage, you had a very interesting original uh, title. Was it was it Xerox Girl? I, <laughs> yes. I thought there had to be a really interesting story about that. Yes, you know, and that's it's a really good place to start because it was the beginning. Um, so yeah, I am old. Thank you. Um, and what I find incredibly interesting is that I would assume a lot of your viewers are going to find this hysterical. But I got my first job by reading um, the classifieds in the New York Times, the Sunday New York Times. And, you know, Ken, listen, you're a little too young to remember this. <laughs> um, but us older folk, when we were looking for a job after we got out of college, we would get the New York Times and we would look at the end of the more or less sunny New York Times and there would be a help wanted ads. I know. Could you believe it? Uh, and then I saw, you know, that there was a, an ad for a advertise, you know, administrative assistant and an entertainment PR firm. And uh, wow, that sounds exciting, right? And during that time, it was all about how fast you could type. That's what your job skills would entail. I know it's a completely different age. We're talking the dinosaurs were, were still roaming around. <laughs> <laughs> People were going, you know, travel was by rickshaw. Um, so anyway, it was a boutique PR firm. And I was really lucky, I have to say. Um, it was an all women boutique PR firm. Um, their number one client was CBS Fox Video. Oh. And I don't know if you remember, or, but that was a joint venture between 20, 20th Century Free Fox and CBS. And it was during the age where um, video had just started. I mean, Beta was... I Beta Max. Right. Beta was leaving and video was coming in. That was like the new format. But anyway, so I got the job and it, you know... I think um, my salary was thirteen thousand five hundred a year. <laughs> hey, that's that's in the big time leagues right there. Starting. Out. I know. Yeah. Well, I mean, they said that you know they would pay me twelve thousand a year, but then they would give me a desk. So I opted for the thirteen thousand five hundred, no desk, um, and that's how I became Xerox Girl because really that's all I did. Uh, so you didn't originally go to school for this purpose? You know, it's an interesting question because there were no schools for this purpose. You know, I graduated in, from college in 1987 and public relations was not a major at the time. Um, I went to Penn State University. The closest thing was communication studies. And I actually went to another school before then, Stockton State College. And I remember that was really the only opportunity I had to take a public relations course. And it was a night course that was given uh, by not a professor, but somebody who worked for, I believe, PSENG at the time. Hmm. And it was all about crisis PR. And so I really, I left Penn State not knowing what public relations was at all. It was just like, oh, okay, public, this sounds cool. So it was really a trial by fire then. Exactly. And so I just, you know what, I really landed in a very nice, small uh, entertainment PR firm. And I ended up working my way up. 
I ended up learning a lot. Um, and I have a lot of really great memories of um, working at the agency, which I worked at for 12 years. So I started as Xerox girl, but I ended up as um, executive vice president. That's quite a few steps uh, above that. <laughs> yeah, it was a ladder. But you know, it was because it was a boutique firm, it was like a, uh, a step ladder. So here's, here's a question for, for those of us in the audience that might not really understand what it means to be in public relations. Specifically, what, what is the purpose of a boutique PR firm? So that's a really good question because a, a lot of people don't understand what publicity is. So we basically get hired to, to like uh, position our client's message and create awareness of our client's message into the press, whatever it may be. And most of our clients are corporate clients, like companies, right? Sure. So if you have a company that is, let's say, releasing a movie. So our job would be contacting all of the media, like you can, and letting them know that the, when the movie's coming out, who's starring the movie, who's available to talk to you about the movie, the actors, the directors, et cetera. So we're the intermediary between the client and the press. And, you know, it's not necessarily just an administrative position where it's like, okay, you're just sending out press releases, which are basically the format in which you're telling the press about what it is you are promoting or publicizing for your client. But, you know, what we do is very strategic and we, you know, pinpoint which audiences we want to hit. And we discuss with the heads of our companies how they want to be positioned. Uh, in the B2B marketplace, you know, business to business and also to the consumers. So, um, and that's actually the part that, you know, I and my colleague Deanna, which we like the most is really strategizing. Does that make sense? I think so. Uh, when you deal with a company uh, more than an individual, does there sometimes tend to be not exactly a conflict of interest, but a conflict of ideology, because I'm sure that these companies have a very specific concept of how they want their product to be consumed and how they want it to be presented, but may not be as aware of the interactions uh, that their product will have as, as you might be. Does that sometimes affect the, the process of dealing with the companies? Sure, sure. I mean, I, I think what you're saying is, um, do I have or have I ever had clients where they're stating that it should be positioned one way and we're saying, actually, it'd be better if it's positioned this way or in right. this audience. And yes, that happens often. Um, and that's sort of a piece of the job, you know. And what happens is we, um, we, cautiously discuss with our client what our thoughts are and you know part of this business too is you know we don't know everything and we're very transparent you know we're we can say you know yeah we think that this positioning is better but what we usually do is we say you know let's start with your positioning and let's sprinkle a little bit in of our positioning and let's see what happens because also you know i've been in this business for about 30 years 30 plus years and you know the old saying is, as you, you, the older you get, the wiser you become in realizing how much you really don't know. And so I'm surprised all the time. And I can, you know, be sitting with the client and be like, you know, no, I don't think that's the right audience. Or, you know, maybe we should go with this audience. And they're, you know, saying, no, no, this is our audience. And, and they're right, you know. Um, so it goes uh, both ways. But that that does happen. And I think that that's a great process to go through with a client, you know, and if you're constantly acquiescing to your client and agreeing with them, it means you're not really thinking, you yeah. know, you're not thinking out of the box. And that's something that we really like to do. And we tend to um, align with independent clients, you know, instead of the larger studios, because they have out of the box thinking Yeah, and they align with us in that way. Oh, would would it also be uh, true to say that a lot of the larger 
uh, entities often try and maybe do that sort of thing in house rather than trying to um, take that to uh, outside PR firms? Yes, that's true. I mean, yeah, there are, you know, you take the larger studios like a 20th Century Fox right. or a Netflix, Amazon, et cetera. Yes. And they will do things in house, obviously. And, um, and they do it very well. There's no, you know, doubt about it. Um, and they, you know, have their procedures. Um, I find that I just find the challenge of going outside of the box the most fun, you yeah. know? Um, when we were doing publicity back in the other agency for CBS Fox, we were doing things that were very much procedure. And I remember feeling like, as long as you do everything properly, you'll do a great job, right? But sometimes there were these little projects that were under the radar that maybe weren't the A titles of, sure. you know, like, and during my day, the A titles were big or a fish called Wanda. Right. <laughs> um, but then you would get these small, you know, like slam dance, or you get these smaller titles that would go under the radar. Believe it or not, one of the titles was Raising Arizona. And oh. so those, yes, and those were the titles that I preferred to work on. And it was in regards to it on video, you know, at the time. Right. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, you know, I, I remember always feeling like it was those, those titles that weren't getting the large, large budgets for marketing, but were so niche that I really enjoyed the challenge of them the most. So since this was um, a completely new industry as you, as you came into it and, and were able to have kind of a clean palette in, in learning how everything went, was there something about how this worked that kind of surprised you? Uh, in regards to the publicity? Or in, to, the in regards to how to approach the, the, the job, as you learned what it meant to be uh, doing PR, was there an aspect to the job that you just never thought would ever have had anything to do with this or that you was just pleasantly surprised? Like, I didn't realize this was kind of a little perk of, of what it was that I did. Um, probably everything. <laughs> because as you said, I went into it, as I said before, I went into it pretty cold. Okay. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that you know, I was never really into it for, and because it is entertainment, it is a glam job, right? I mean, you get to meet, I was so lucky, you know, I got to work with Magic Johnson and, you know, I have wonderful stories about, you know, being with Audrey Meadows and, you know, I, I was so lucky. And those are the things that I feel like are the big perks to right. create these, these short relationships with these people who are, you know, very creative, very, you know, awe-inspiring. Um, and, you know, it's not just about the swag that you get or, you know, the tickets that you get to the football games or whatever it may be. Um, but I mean, I think what it really comes down to for me, and I think also for everybody in my company, you know, the thing that really matters the most and feels the best is when you get that big placement, you know, when you get you know, the New York Times for your client or the Wall Street Journal or the Tonight Show. I mean, those are the things that you're like, and I guess I really didn't anticipate when I got into publicity that, you know, when I did play something in the New York Times or a large publication like that, that it would really have an effect on people, you know, and listen, I'm not saving the world here or anything. However, just knowing that Oh wow, like I can I can place a story in a large publication and it could, you know, either you know increase increase sales of something or make people think differently. Um, something I one of my prior clients, which is you know, one of the most inspirational clients I had, uh, is a woman um, by the name of Somali Mom. And I don't know if you're familiar with her or not. Um, okay. Are you familiar with her? Vague, vaguely. vaguely. Uh, about less, less. I, I need. Uh, you know, there's so much stuff out there. I, I often touch a lot of different things, but I don't get as immersed into it as I would like to be. Yeah. No. I, I know you have to keep track of a lot of different things at a 
many different moments of the day. So um, I, you know, I had landed this project. I, I don't even know how, quite honestly, it was a, like a phone call. You know, I get most of my business through referral and people who know us in the business. And I received a call from these two young men who had just gotten out of the Air Force, like Air Force school. Um, and they had stumbled upon um, a YouTube video. And this, I mean, maybe it was even MySpace at the time. I mean, we're talking the early 2000s. And they had um, checked out a video of this school called AFICEP in Cambodia that rescued girls from sex trafficking. And Somali mom was the head of it. And so they decided to create, or first after they decided to go and visit the school, which of course, you know, was, you know, life-changing for them. That'd be amazing. Yeah, I mean, unbelievable. Um, but uh, they came back and they said, we want to start a foundation here in, in New York and in the US. And would you help us do the publicity for it? And it's sex trafficking. And I was like, yes, I would love to. Um, you know, that was a client that was so inspiring and so life changing. Um, and that was one of those clients where, you know, I got her on the Tyra Bank show and we ended up, and, and her, her English was really bad and we had to get a translator and we got a former sex slave because Somali was a former sex slave also. And, um, you know, we raised like 40 to $50,000 from just on that show for the organization. So, I mean, things like that are really, you know, I guess you would call the perks of the business if you align yourself with the right clients. Being able to have a, a, a lasting positive effect or assist in, in creating a, a positive change forward. That's, that's a rare, a rare gift. Yeah. And, and also one that really allows you to, you know, put perspective on your life you know, in the respect of, I remember, you know, being in the, the green room, you know, waiting for Susan Sarandon actually was on the show, uh, helping to promote, you know, uh, the cause, which was wonderful. And I just remember waiting in the green room with Somali and this young girl who, you know, came, flew in from Cambodia and Susan, and I was like, wow, this is really a moment. You know, this is, this is clearly a different moment than any other moment that I've been involved with before. Yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty powerful being able to be, be part of something like that. Yeah. So, okay. So that does also bring a question to mind. So you, you've talked about helping your clients by dealing with often large publications, whether they be newspapers, magazines, uh, talk shows, things like that, being able to spread information about what it is that's important to them. The face of the industry has clearly changed significantly over the last couple of decades. What kind of challenges has that presented to your organization, to your work? And how do you uh, kind of keep up and uh, adjust your strategy to be able to more successfully uh, engage a public that has so many more options on where they get their information? Well, um, that's a really good question. So we're really lucky because um, my, our niche is, was, was video to DVD and Blu-ray, and now it's streaming. So it's interesting because I always would say to clients, you know, always the bridesmaid, right? Because the film or the TV show or, you know, whatever it was, you know, we were always like the physical product, right? But now we're the streaming channels and my clients are heavily involved in all of that. So I feel like the changes have worked to our advantage. Um, the things that we've had to change, obviously we've had to uh, make sure that we're going to the right reporters, you know, that are doing online, um, online reviews of our clients, television shows and films and documentaries, et cetera. Um, the, you know, so 
there's been a switch to who's covering what beats. Uh, we got to make sure that we're on top of all the podcasts like you can. That's very important. Podcast was a big thing, you know, like three or four years ago, I was like, you know, talking to, to my office and I'm like, what's a podcast? Like, and should we have them on our mailing list? You know? And now it's like, you know, how could we not? We have um, a gentleman, Matthew in our office who, and Deanna in my office too, they listen to podcasts religiously. Um, so I'm like, all right, but let's put them on the lists, you know, uh, make sure they have all the information. But it's been actually uh, a benefit for us, honestly. Yeah, the, the, the industry is so, is so different now. It, it's, it's often a little confusing when I, at least looking at it from the outside in, trying to understand the dynamics between the production companies and the talent that they have working for them and the uh, other uh companies surrounding them that support the process and how it finally gets to us. It's, it's becoming a little, a little more confusing. It feels like every day to try and get a grasp of how all of this interconnects. Yeah, no, honestly, Ken, as a consumer, I have to tell you, I am, you know, like, what do I do? do am I watching, you know, AVOD? Am I watching SVOD? You know, there's so much content out there. And if we think back, you know, it was, you know, you couldn't watch a film until it was either in the theater or then, you know, there were windows. Right. The windows are gone. And COVID had a lot to do with that also. So, but I think the beauty of it is that there's now content for free. Mm -hmm. um, and there is, you, you get more of a choice of how you want to watch it. You can watch it without commercials. You can watch it for free with commercials. Um, and I also think production value has gone up it's big time impressive. as a result. Very, very impressive. So I really feel like, you know, in the next few years, I think there's going to be more of a change. I feel like, um, I don't know if things are going to merge or, you know, there's going to be less of a chance in regards to, uh, you know, the, less of a, so many different choices. And sorry, that's my phone. <laughs> You're the just fine. The bots are calling all the time. Um, <laughs> but, you know, we have, we have so many choices now, but what's going to be interesting to see upcoming is how our choices became less. And, you know, I always look back to see what's going to happen in the future. The same thing happened when there were so many channels happening as you remember, probably when cable first started, right. you know, you had, the, you know, the, the food network, the dessert network, the, the, you know, like the, and then finally things started to, you know, conglomerate a bit, you know, the satellite, I remember the, um, the satellite dishes came out and there was like 117 channels. Yeah. And I even think Bruce Springsteen even wrote a song about it. So here's, here's the thing, though, as we see these shifts occur, I mean, uh, talking about how we start, I mean, I, I remember having three, three channels that I could watch before. Yes. Oh my God. <laughs> I mean, All right. You know. So you're in my generation. Yeah, I was, was going to say, I, I was really appreciative of what you said earlier. So I'm glad she thinks I'm as young as she thinks that I am. <laughs> um, but, you know, at, as you're talking about as cable expanded things, we still had a shared experience. There was still this limitation that we have. We're either watching the network televisions, we're still watching a limited number of actual real choices on cable. We still have the movie theater where we can go see things. But with so many streaming options seeming, uh, seeming to just pop out of the woodwork, every major corporation wants to have their own streaming service. Doesn't that, do you think that might serve to fragment the audience and ultimately detract from what they're trying to accomplish. Well, the question is, what are they trying to accomplish, do you think? There is, it was any company, it's, it's, it's about market share. So, I mean, I understand wanting to have control of the property, wanting to have control of how it is being uh, served to the public and trying to get as much of that public as possible to become part of your loyal uh, group that is is with that. 
But when you have Netflix and you've got HBO and you've got IMDb and you've got all of these other companies, we only have so much time in the day. And that, that shared, the thing that links us together and actually ends up amplifying that emotional connection to the content, being able to share that with the people around us tends to shrink. It, it seems to me that it could go against their best interest as, as these uh, projects can potentially lose a bit of that impact that they may lose some of their audience at the same time. Do you think that is a potential problem? I mean, if you don't, that's a good question. I'm, I'm not quite sure. Um, I know as a consumer, you know, I don't know. You stumped me, Ken. I know. I asked um, the hard question sometimes. Like, yeah, that's a tough one. Um, and I'm not afraid to say, I don't know, but uh, I can say as a consumer and, you know, I, I subscribe to a lot. Um, I go for content, you know, and if I see, you know, that, Kate Winslet. Kate, Kate Winslet is going to be on Merritt East Town on HBO Max. I'm going, you know, right. I'm going to HBO Max. And if, you know, I re know that there's a show that's premiering and it's only going to be on IMDb TV, I'm going to IMDb. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I don't feel like for me, and I guess you could equate this, and I always felt this way when we were working in video, DVD, Blu-ray. I'm not going to mention Laserdisc, um, but there was that too uh, for a short period of time. Big, big. <laughs> Remember how huge they were? Yes, yes. At great quality, um, but just, you know, very short-lived. Um, that I would always have the, I would always have the, um, the philosophy that somebody's not going to go into a blockbuster and say, what's new on Paramount? What is, you know what, right. what is Buena Vista released this week? I always felt like a consumer does not necessarily care about the studio. They care about the content. And I think that goes, you know, forever. I mean, I, I just feel like if the content is good and the production is good and, you know, I myself personally, I follow specific directors that I like you know, like uh, Den Denis Villeneuve. I love his stuff. So I'm going to go and I'm going to seek that out on whatever platform it is. Now, if I have small children, which I don't, I have a very old child <laughs> who's just turned 19 <laughs> um, and watches anime. So we do have Crunchyroll. Um, but, you know, I do think that Disney Plus would be one of those formats that we would have to have. You know, right. um, and I would seek out other formats that had children's programming because that's, you know, just something PBS kids, you know, one of my clients, PBS, we would have to have the Amazon, you know, PBS kids on Prime Video for right. sure. Um, so there would be those, you know, definites that would ha have to be, but it is hard as a consumer, you know, and I think, I think the, I think the market the or the industry is going to have to sort of be the the conduit in telling in, in, in more or less giving the consumer the choices. I think, you know, I don't know, honestly, I don't know if it's going to be the consumer that's going to be telling right. the studios or if it's the studios that are going to be telling the consumer. I mean, we know about MGM and Amazon that just happened. Yeah, that's you exciting. Know? about Discovery Plus that just happened. So it's beginning, but I just don't know. Good question for my clients. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought there might've been a chance, you know, direct uh, contacts can have a lot of interesting information. Yeah, I know, I know. But it's, you know, it's one of those things where you just have to wait and see. Well, speaking of uh, waiting and seeing, um, I, I know one of the projects that you ha have been helping to promote has been the the fantastic uh, leverage redemption coming up here soon. I I know uh, I am for one quite excited about that, and uh, I know several people who are also quite excited. Uh, how did you become uh, involved with working around this particular project? 
Well, actually, I work with electric entertainment. So I'm more so on the corporate side of things. Mm -hmm. So um, a Amazon and IMDb TV, they're really the front runners who are promoting the show and they're doing an amazing job. So I do the um, more of the corporate press when it comes to that mm -hmm. and handling things you know, with Dean Devlin. Uh, the the very famous Dean Devlin um, and some of the you know other actors um, when it comes to certain interviews um, but yeah that's going to be a fabulous show and really looking forward to its debut um, it's yeah I think the fans are going to be very happy with it yeah I, I I somehow I don't see how it couldn't go well it's uh, the people behind it are all fantastic they've they've proven that they um pretty much hit a home run anytime they they touch anything uh, but of course uh, it's it, important for you to to uh, and everybody to tell everyone you know how awesome it is to advertise it uh, <laughs> yes speaking of advertising don't forget putting people to catch us on all of our social media to keep up to date with what's going on in the world of pudding where are you most active richard well, you could see some of my activity on our Instagram account. Would that happen to be at Pudding Guys? That one would, yes. Amazing. You know what? That is also our Facebook. So you can about once a month <laughs> see, if, see you're lucky. Something. if you're lucky, we'll post something on Facebook. We're probably most, most on Twitter at Real Pudding Guys. But of course, you can catch us on Patreon as pudding guys that's right where for just one dollar a day you can support us as we bring you new interviews new material new stuff to make our interviews and material look better it's just fantastic for only a dollar a month a paltry a lot no it's, not really it really isn't that's actually twelve dollars over the course of a year right small change to help the pudding guys keep going and we love our supporters we look forward to seeing you on social media. So one question I did have to ask, just because one of the, there are all sorts of credits that you've been associated with. And you're, you talked a little bit about being, uh, being able to meet some really interesting people. Um, could you tell me what was Airbud like? I mean, he seemed really happy as a dog. <laughs> Air Bud the dog. Yeah. <laughs> That was a lot of fun working with them. Yes. And um, yeah, we worked with them for a while. Listen, Airbud's a brand. Yeah. I had no idea. You know, I miss that because I'm not of the generation. And my son was about, uh, you know, six or seven. You know, it, it, it was unfortunate, but I missed the wave with my kid and I obviously am too old for it. But once I got into the nitty gritty of it and I saw how many people loved it and how much branding was behind, like it was, it was very easy for us to get press for it. And that's really, um, you know, that's really, uh, I guess you would say a, a, a magical thing is when you get a client where you're not having to do too much education. Yeah for yeah. the brand and the brand is already um is, is already there and all you have to do is pick up the phone or email the press and be like um you know we've got a new airbud movie and they're like okay send it to me yeah. you know that's always it's, fun and so heartwarming and silly and fun i just like yeah. Yeah, get to be involved with something like that it's a, it's a i imagine it would be more um delightful to run PR for something like that than for something like say seven, which <laughs> good movie, but you know, you get a little, little dark. It's like, yeah. Oh, you know, I have to tell you the children's programming is always fun. Well, if you, you know, looked, you probably saw that my, my firm started with the launch of the Wiggles. Yeah. And I don't know if you have kids or not, but I launched them and, and it was the Barney people who contacted me because they had the license for the Wiggles at the time. And they were like, listen, we got these four guys and they're from Australia and we want a New York PR firm. We want to do something at the Australian consulate in New York. Are you interested? And it was my very first project. Like I left my old agency 
And I was like, I'm gonna start my own company. How do I do this? It was one of those things. And I just called everybody that I knew in the industry. And I was like, listen, you know, I'm starting my own agency. And if you have any projects, just send them my way. And that was the very first one. And the beauty of that, and I, I'm glad you brought up Airbud because, you know, it was, I was obviously incredibly nervous. It was my first project and I had, you know, no staff because it was just me. I just left my agency. And um, I was like, wow, I, I really have to kick ass on this. You know, like this right. is my first project. And there was absolutely no awareness of the Wiggles. And this was in the early, um, no, 1998, actually. And everybody was, every, what everybody was writing about was the Teletubbies and, which, and, and that the purple one was gay. I remember yeah. that was, do you remember that? I do. I, I do remember. I remember the the particular religiously inclined individual that made such statements. <laughs> yeah. And, <laughs> and that's all people were writing about. And I was like, wow, I really need to figure out a strategy, you know, because these guys obviously are huge in Australia. They were huge in the UK. They, they must have something. I had nephews at the time that I did some testing on and I showed them, you know, uh, the Wiggles, and they loved it, you know, catchy tunes and all. And I don't know if you remember the Noodle Cadoodles. They have these little Noodle Cadoodle stores. Um, I do. It was kind of like, you know, little Toys R Us stores. Right. And, you know, they came over um, and they were doing these little Noodle Cadoodle concerts and like nobody was there. Aww. And I felt so bad. I was literally dragging people in from like the malls because they were in malls. And, you know, Oh, what I decided to do was, you know, I'm, I'm not going to hit the entertainment, the children's entertainment reporters or producers because they're only interested in barring the Teletubbies. Right. Um, so I just started hitting the reporters and producers who I knew had kids and just started sending to them the copies of the Wiggles little music videos and their kids just fell in love with it. And that started the awareness. But you know what, I cannot take full credit for it because what Barney, the, the Barney company did that was genius was they started to put the music videos in front of the Barney TV, uh, Barney videos. Uh, so they, had, they grabbed their audience. And so that, you know, the kids were watching the Wiggles videos. And then a year and a half after promoting them, I just remember being, I think I was on Block Island. I don't know if you know where that is, but I and I remember um, sitting uh, with my boyfriend at the time and the at the table next to us, they had children and they were singing hot potato, hot potato. And I was like, <laughs> oh my God. And I was like looking at my boyfriend, I'm like, are they singing a wiggle song? And he was like, yeah, they're singing a wiggle song. And then we started to, and, and they said they were putting it in front of the Barney videos. And I was like, all right, that's great. So. Well, and that, that brings up an interesting potential question too, because we talked about uh, the aspect of your job and trying to get the attention to this product. And sometimes some reactions will not necessarily be positive, as you mentioned with the, the, the purple um, the purple one being a, an issue with some, some people. Um, do you have to deal with that aspect of the job at all, being able to bypass potential hurdles? And, and are there any specific instances that you could share to, that uh, you've had to adjust some unfortunate thing occurred and then you're able to still be able to uh, create a positive uh, reaction? Right. Um, you know, not, I've been really lucky, not often. I mean, and I think a, a, a lot has to be said because I don't represent celebrities per se. Right. I represent companies, you know? Um, and I think that happens a lot more with the celebrity PR and the tabloids and things like that. Um, and that usually are, you know, the personal publicists for the celebrities, unfortunately that, you know, have to deal with that. Um, but when things like that do occur, um, it's not necessarily just a publicity issue. Like the whole team comes together and it's, you know, more or less a marketing issue, a publicity issue. And, you know, 
I've been really lucky. I can't, if I'm trying to think of any major crisis that has happened, and I hope I don't, you know, say anything now that puts it in the universe that now there's going to be this major crisis that's going to happen with a client. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I, I've been pretty lucky. I mean, I think the closest thing to it was uh, Cher did the first, um, uh, one of the first celebrity fitness videos back in the day. I don't remember Cher right. Fitness. And, you know, we had to work with a lot of things that surrounded, you know, Cher's fitness and, you know, um, things like that because she is a larger than life celebrity. But, you know, there was no major, major blunders or major things that we had to clean up. So I've been pretty lucky that way. That's always, uh, always a blessing to, uh, to be sure, to be able to kind of tiptoe around what has to be not so much a minefield, but you know, it's just life things, things happen. And there are just unfortunate events. And, uh, you know, I, I've, I've seen some uh, companies have to deal with just, uh, you know, some something happens, and you still well, we still have this wonderful thing for you to, to be able to enjoy. Forget about this, uh, you know, other thing that really has nothing to do with it, just try and try and get the most out of it. Right. Um, okay, well, how about this on a more more positive. You're talking about, um, you know, having a, a son that's into anime and having had the chance to be exposed to some particularly interesting uh, projects over the years. Has your work with some of these companies uh, and seeing things from the perspective that you've been able to see it changed your tastes over the years on how you consume media? I'm sure. I'm sure there's no doubt. Um, you know, when even looking at trailers, you know, and I'm sure, Ken, you do the same thing as you're in the business. <laughs> and you'd be like, wow, that trailer's cut really well. Yeah. <laughs> but is it as good as the movie? You know what I mean? Like, there's just certain things that you're, you can see that maybe people who are not in the industry can't. Even when it comes to, you know, watching actors do their press junket, interviews and i'm not saying when with our projects and just you know other projects like oh okay yeah i see they're in the hotel yeah. you know i see where the placement is in the back um you know what I, just those things if they don't ruin it for me i still watch it if you know a favorite you know director or uh actor is being interviewed and i know it's one of many interviews that i've done in the hotel junk i'm still gonna watch it but yeah, it's definitely, but I think for me, I like it. I like knowing that I know these things, you know, it makes me feel a little bit more on the in. I know that sounds silly, but it is that's, what it is. That's not silly at all. It's uh, anything that can create um, a feeling that, 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 that makes it special, that makes it unique and stand out is generally a good thing. It just, it helps to cement it as, as part of your life experience and, that's, that's awesome. I mean, cause that's, that's what makes up who we are. Right. Yeah. So from the other end, you know, yes. I've, I've had a joy in, and, and being able to deal with you, uh, generally via email, <laughs> um, from the people that you deal with on the other side, I have to expect that there is a certain level of unfamiliarity with with how everything works how how has your inner have you ever had something uh occur in in, in the, without naming any names or anything but a correspondence where you're you're just kind of scratching your heads like how did how did this exactly happen i i don't i don't understand what just occurred here <laughs> no, all right you're so vague now I'll, wait a minute do you mean like with a client or a, a, a journalist or so like, like with the journalists, the people that you're, that you're generally dealing with that yeah. might approach you knowing that you represent certain individuals. Yeah. Have, have, have you ever been approached with just a really weird request or, or something of that nature? Um, you know, I, wow. Hmm. I mean, I think everybody's pretty respectful. I mean, I'm being 100% authentic with this answer. <laughs> not that I'm not being authentic with other answers. But He's not dancing around anything, we swear. 
Yeah, of course not. But um, no, uh, I mean, listen, last minute requests where, you know, the media are like, I need this tomorrow and it's 5 p.m. Eastern time or, you know, I don't think I've received anything out of the ordinary, like, oh, can we get a shot of your client on an elephant? You know, like <laughs> nothing like that. Oh, um, I, I wish you had got something like that. <laughs> I, you know, like, I mean, clearly I would love to tell you about that. Um, I, you know, there is clearly though a hierarchy when it comes to the media and you know, this is something, and you can, you know this about me and my firm, we treat everybody the same, you know, yeah. we're humanists. And, you know, there is a, um, you know, like certain media are gonna feel like they can get what they want yesterday, you know, uh -huh. and others, you know, are more patient. And we just try to work with everybody and get everybody what they want and on time. Um, but no, nothing like completely unusual that I can think of. Yeah, because you, you, you sometimes hear those stories. You hear about riders that certain bands have. When we're going to perform at a certain place, I have to have the olives with the pimentos removed. And if not, I'm going to throw a fit. Or Oh, you, you mean know. the actual talent? Well, no, I always look for, for anything from journals. dealing specifically with you because, you know, you, I'm sure you've heard of some secondhand stories where that has occurred, but. Yeah, you know, no. I, I do have a great story, though, that I thought you would really appreciate um, that I was thinking about. Um, so I did, you know, as I said, I spent a lot of time with Audrey Meadows. I don't know if you're a Honeymooners fan. Are you a Honeymooners fan? I not so much. Again, somebody I'm aware of, but I've not really had the chance okay. to really absorb material from. So it's Jackie Gleason, The Honeymooners. Right. Um, have you ever watched an episode? I have. I've seen uh, about four or five episodes. Okay, yeah. So you know Alice, you know. Right. So um, one of the requests I had received from her, because, and this is probably what back in the early 90s, I was doing publicity. I was at the other agency I worked at, and I was doing publicity for the Classic 39. And the classic 39 are the original 39 Honeymooners episodes. And, um, you know, they will constantly be in demand. I mean, it's just, it's one of those things. It was in demand on beta, it's a made on video, DVD, and streaming. It will do very well. Right. Um, so we had Audrey Meadows uh, available to do a media tour for us. Um, it was yes, the early 90s, and the Classic 39 was coming out on video. And so we did a, a, a jump, like a press tour in LA that it was only me doing, and then there was a press tour in New York. And Audrey had said, you know, I, I will do all the press that you want, but I have to stop by the Museum of Moving Image. Um, which I think is still around. I don't know if it was renamed. There's one in LA, I think now, but there was one the Museum of Moving Image and I need to watch the Jackie Gleason show. Uh. And I was like, okay, like, sure. But you know, I was young then and in, more neurotic than I am now. And uh, I was like, oh God, we got to fit this into the schedule. You know, you know it's like, <laughs> and you know, we, I had her on live with Regis and Kathy Lee. Yes, I'm that old. It was Regis and Kathy Lee. Yeah, and you know, this whole thing, and I'm like, how am I going to fit this in? So we ended up doing it around lunchtime. And so, Audrey told me the story about how she was cast for Alice and she wanted, I think she was on Broadway at the time. We're talking like the 1950s, right? And she was on the, um, on Broadway at the time and her agent had sent over to Jackie because Jackie was in charge of casting a picture of Alice, a, you know, glamour shot. Yeah. And he was like, no, that is not Alice. And immediately said no, didn't even get an audition. And, you know, Audrey was really upset. So, and Jackie had said to the agent, Alice, is, you know, is, is not this pretty. Alice is rough around the edges. And the agent took that back to Audrey. So Audrey decided, okay, I'm gonna get a photographer to come over and going to put my hair in rollers 
and take a picture of me the minute I get out of bed. Huh. And took that shot and then sent it over to Jackie. And Jackie was like, who's this girl? This is Alice. <laughs> and that's how she got the job, right? But interestingly enough, she wanted to see those Jackie Gleason episodes because it was all on Kinescope. Yeah. And there was, she had no idea who Alice was until we stopped by the Museum of Moving Image in the early 90s. And she watched it. We were the only ones, obviously, in the theater, and she watched it. And she's like, now I know what Jackie was talking about. Because she was able to see the original Alice in the Jackie Gleason show. And I was like, and, you know, as we were going back about the moments, I was, that was a major moment that I was like, wow, I'm so happy I was able to be here. Like for that moment, I calmed down and I wasn't worried about the clock and the next media outlet we had to be out. And I was like, wow, this is, this is really a moment. I mean, I, I'm lucky to have been a part of it. That's amazing. That, that's just. Yeah, that was a special, a special thing. So those things, you know, those are perks of the job. That's, that's too cool. Being able to be, be adjacent to a, a, a major, part of pop culture history and somebody that was able to construct it help to, to make it that's that's just kind of gives you the tingles uh, even hearing yeah. about it I hear feel it yeah and she remained very close with Jackie until you know he passed and um yeah it was it was really nice and I, I was lucky you know we had uh, established a nice relationship and every time she was in New York we went to Mr. Chow's her favorite restaurant nice and she was funny well, oh, she was so funny. She had the best sense of humor. Well, speaking of food, one of the questions we often ask our, uh, our guests on here is so that we can have something that has nothing to do with what we're talking about. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what type of a pizza person are you? You're in New York. This is my co-host's favorite, favorite question to ask. Are you a New York slice kind of a person? Or are you, or are you more of a uh, a deep dish Chicago kind of a person. What do you go for? You know, it's really interesting. My son, and here's a plug for Sal and Carmine's. There's a place on the Upper West Side called Sal and Carmine's. It's very famous. He will only eat Sal and Carmine's pizza. However, I don't like pizza with too much tomato sauce. I'm more of a cheese gal. Mm -hmm. I know this is going to sound really silly, but and you're gonna laugh, but I love bowling alley pizza. Huh. Now, you know what I'm talking about. I do. Um, when I was growing up, every bowling alley I went to made pizza. I grew up in New Jersey, and I gotta tell you, it was always my favorite pizza. Not so much a deep dish gal. Uh, you know, I'll eat it. Yeah. But, you know, I'm more of a, you know, heavily pizza fied bowling alley, uh, heavily cheesified bowling alley pizza eater well and a lot of times you never know what those those things are going to just make that link in your mind i've, I've had a couple of people i've talked to where they would go well, you know the 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 square pieces of pizza you would get at school in the cafeteria <laughs> oh god yes i remember those <laughs> that's my pizza it's like <laughs> okay uh, okay <laughs> yeah, somebody else is gonna be like when you say, oh, I was talking to Jill, she's a publicist. She liked the bowling alley pizza when she was growing up. They'd be like, what? That was the worst. No, no. Uh, pizza the, is almost a universal thing. There's there's so many different variants and things to love about it. It's hard to have bad pizza. So it's it's generally pretty easy to, to, to get a good answer out of that because, you know, it's just, it's joy. It's joy that you get to consume. <laughs> comfort food. Well, I cannot tell you how much I appreciate you taking the time to come talk to us today. And uh, I, uh, I'm going to be thinking about this conversation probably for the next couple of hours, just because this is, this is the kind of thing that, that, that keeps my spirits up seeing the, seeing the, the, the people that really help make things smoothly come out and allow me to see them uh, much more easily. Uh, we always appreciate the efforts that you make and and people in your firm uh just a round of applause Aww, thanks ken so appreciate you you have no idea well, seriously I I, yeah. I I i will take any love i can get <laughs> <laughs> throw it at you now <laughs> all right 
Well, thank right. you again for thank coming you. on. Okay. Bye. Don't forget to come back and catch us next week. We have a movie review, something topical, something that needs topical ointments. I'm really not sure. Uh, I think one of the key words in the title is dead. And um, that's kind of our outlook on this. Maybe we'll see. Yeah. Take with that. Uh, take from that what you will, but uh, we will be reviewing uh, Zack Snyder's army of the dead. Is it a fantastic and fun romp through violence and gore, or is it a tired tale that's been stomped into the ground? Come back and find out. <laughs>